we go. Okay, that should be recording now, I hope. Yeah, it is recording. Okay, perfect. Prof, over to you. Okay. Okay, so good evening, everybody. It's, um, yeah, we're in the middle of the surge of, of COVID, so I really appreciate your time. And thanks very much to Ned Ken, especially to Mandy, um, for organizing uh, this very important series. Um, I think Mandy's at, uh, um, in, in, at the helm of uh, some COVID uh, activities, and uh, I think has been incredibly busy and, and made a huge contribution to the COVID response. So what I'm going to do tonight is to give you an update on the current situation and where we are. I'm going to um, touch on the hospital surveillance system that we established at the NICD um, at the end of March. I'm going to look at some of the comorbidity uh, information that we've managed to uh, obtain from, from the hospital related data. I'm going to look at some of the laboratory testing strategies, what the tests mean. Um, look at uh, the new isolation and quarantine uh, regulations, um, some of which are hot of the press and I think have caused quite a, a lot of confusion. And then um, I think that will probably take us uh, most of the way through. And I think there's a couple of bits at the end and some really good news. We need good news um, in, in the, this uh, middle of the COVID pandemic and the results of the new um, the new results from the vaccine trial were released yesterday and they're, they're really incredibly promising. And then I'll finish off with just a few words about healthcare worker infections, why they're a problem and, and what we can do to, to reduce them. So there's a really beautiful virus. Who would have thought that in just six months, uh, this virus would, would change our world um, in the way that it has, but we will get through, um, although the next few months are going to be tough and we're gonna to have to learn to live with COVID, hopefully not in the same way that it's affecting us at the moment. So next slide, please. Mandy, you're in charge. So um, the NICD captures data from uh, uh, laboratory confirmations from private and public laboratories. We update our statistics every day. We feed them through to the minister and we place them on our website. Um, NICD website and they can be accessed by all. So we have a, um, an impressive 373,628 cases. We are obviously the highest in Africa, but I think it reflects um, our testing, um, which is quite extensive versus many other parts of Africa. The majority of the cases are in Gauteng, um, and there's been a massive increase in the number of cases over the last a few, few days in the last week in Karting. Uh, Western Cape was the leader before, and um, I think the Eastern Cape data probably isn't a true reflection, because I think uh, cases are, patients are dying at home, they're not all reaching the hospitals. I think you've seen some rather um, concerning um, pictures of what's happening in the Eastern Cape hospitals. So the total number of deaths, um, Recorded to date is 5,173. I think it's lower than what's been seen in many of the countries in the West, probably reflects um, slightly younger age group in Africa, but I'm not sure that it's a true reflection of what is happening out there. And there certainly are deaths that are not being captured, particularly in, uh, in chronic care centers and in patients dying at home, particularly uh, in the Eastern Cape province where they certainly aren't all reaching um, hospital. So Gauteng, next slide please. So Gauteng is seeing um, the major surge. Um, I think the Western Cape kind of led the way. And from my, what I've heard and from what we're seeing in hospital admissions, and I think hospital, hospital admissions give you a very good reflection of what is happening. Um, they're probably plateauing off. And certainly the number of admissions are starting to decrease. I think they have uh, managed incredibly well very well organized and during the lockdown they used the period very well to prepare uh, additional health facilities to get the hospital ready and um, I think their health care workers have done a, a phenomenal job. So um, Gauteng has seen this, this major surge. Uh, Western, the um, Eastern Cape I think is uh, 
pretty well close to that. And I think we're starting to see an increase in cases um, in, in KZN. Uh, the other provinces, which are much more rural, um, have far fewer cases. It's difficult to say what we will see there. Um, I don't think they have the levels of transmission that kind of started us off, um, but time will tell, uh, especially when the, uh, the cases move into more district type hospitals uh, where care may, may be slightly different. So the DAFCOV um, is a hospital-based sentinel hospital system. We capture <coughs> information from both public sector and, and private hospitals. Uh, we have about 200 hospitals on the system. So it's sentinel. Um, we're planning to expand it. And the DAFCOV system, which was uh, put in place um, as a vision of mine and then really uh, attracted the most amazing team uh, at the end of March and started to produce data at the end of April, will now be adopted as the hospital-based surveillance system for the country, but it's gonna take a little while to roll out and uh, we will be contacting some of you. Um, so Sentinel means it's, um, it's, it's limited, but it was designed to, to give us information of what the picture of, of COVID looks like in South Africa. And is it different to elsewhere? What are the epidemiological features in terms of age? Um, what are the comorbidities that we're seeing so that we can um, identify those patients most at risk in, in the community? Uh, what is the clinical picture? And we're attempting to also um, get some data on clinical management and outcomes. Um, but that's a little more difficult because it's a tick box and you don't get really the true picture. So I think we've got very good information on comorbidities and uh, special population groups. So to date, we've had um, uh, information and data collected on 20, just over 23,000 patients um, from uh, when we started to collect data to last week, where we're always a week behind in trying to clean up the data. Next uh, slide, please. So um, the good news is that uh, just over 50% of, of patients who've been admitted, these are patients within the DATCOV system, uh, have been discharged. Obviously, there may be some sequelae. It's important to follow patients up. Uh, more long-term problems with lungs have been uh, um, identified, and that's something we need to look for in the future. So case fatality rate, um, we haven't got outcomes on everybody yet. There are still patients in hospital. Um, this is the hospital mortality rate is around 19%. I think if you look at the overall uh, case fatality rate, where you would look at, be looking, considering cases in the community, it's obviously very, very much lower. So I think this is uh, lower than some of the um, countries in the North. And I think um, we have a major advantage coming a little later in, in the, the pandemic. And I think um, for in-hospital treatment, and I think you've already had some, some talks and you will have others, I think we've really learned a lot. And the focus is really on oxygen, uh, new methods of administering oxygen, particularly with high flow oxygen, um, not uh, absolutely depending on ventilation, ventilators where the mortality is high, proning, the use of dexamethasone um, and anticoagulation. So I think there, there's definitely an, an advantage in, in coming a little later. And every day there's uh, some new treatment that's uh, been studied, uh, not always uh, randomized controlled uh, trials, but um, in the next week, we'll be starting the WHO Solidarity Study, which is a randomized controlled trial looking at various treatment interventions. Some of the medications, some of the drugs have had to be uh, kind of dropped. The um, antiretrovirals were dropped, chloroquine was dropped, um, given that they haven't shown efficacy. Um, but we look forward to some of the outbreaks, of, um, the outcomes of that. Next one, please. Okay, so what are the factors here that have been associated with more severe illness and also with mortality? And I think many of them are very similar to what has been shown in, in, other outbreak, in the outbreaks in, um, in other countries. Certainly older age group, and um, if you look at uh, uh, patients from age of 60, 65 upwards, there is definitely an, increased, an increase in severe disease and in mortality male sex, and we're not sure if that has something to do with uh, receptors, 
uh, for the virus that may be related, something that needs to be investigated. And then the presence of comorbidities. And if you have more than one, your uh, risk of uh, severe disease and the fatal outcome will obviously uh, be increased. I think I'm about to have a visit from my cat. Let me move it away, sorry. We have uh, someone who's more interested in the presentation. So I think uh, the important comorbidities are di um, hypertension, uh, diabetes, and that would be both type one and both type two. And importantly to remember that this may be the first presentation um, patients present with a DKA for the very first time. And certainly um, I think undiagnosed or underdiagnosed hypertension and diabetes may well be uh, an issue out there. Um, I think the measurement of uh, HPA1C is something that we're going to look at uh, for patients who are not known diabetics uh, to get some indication of uh, undiagnosed disease. I think chronic cardiac disease of various kinds, chronic renal disease, um, chronic lung disease, including tuberculosis, but not, not uh, a major issue there, but certainly chronic uh, pulmonary disease, patients with current malignancies, patients who are immunosuppressives, and I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about HIV in the next slide. But just to mention that um, one of the, the major problems we're having at the moment are in-hospital uh, outbreaks, uh, community um, deaths, so we're not getting a true picture, chronic care homes where um, there have been major outbreaks, patients die, they have a known comorbidity, they don't get tested for COVID. We're trying to include them in our surveillance program and we currently have 12 of these chronic care homes and we hope to get important data and also support them. Very important to confirm uh, testing, uh, confirm COVID in, in patients who die and perhaps we can talk a little bit more about that testing and what should be done. Uh, next one. So what we don't know is um, the level, you know, how does the level of control affect uh, the occurrence of more severe COVID and uh, negative outcomes? It's likely that those who are less controlled will have a, um, a more negative outcome. Uh, we don't know lots about older age versus uh, those who frail versus those who are relatively fit. They always say 70s and new 60 and 60s and new 50. But um, that's something that we need to look at. And I think there have been a couple of patients who are well over 90, who've had very mild illness and have actually done very well. But certainly older age group, um, often with comorbidities, has definitely been associated with uh, more severe disease. Um, obesity is definitely um, something that was flagged in, uh, in uh, countries experiencing outbreaks in the Northern Hemisphere. It's uh, difficult to get good information, difficult to, to measure uh, weights accurately and heights and BMIs. Um, some people use mid-arm circumference. Um, we have included something that just said, you know, do you think the patient is obese, morbidly obese? Um, so it's, it's not always an accurate measure um, and we don't always get good information there, but obesity is absolutely key. Um, in, in patients who are experiencing more disease. Sometimes it goes together with diabetes, with hypertension, um, but obesity and uh, why it's associated is not absolutely certain, but it's part, probably part of some metabolic syndrome. Diabetes is probably related to some endothelial inflammation. I think these are things that need to be further investigated. Next one, please. So some special groups. I think the big question about um, COVID in, in Africa was, does HIV predispose you to more disease, a more severe disease, mort is the mortality increase? Are there some special complications? Um, so we have quite a, an extensive list of uh, HIV infected uh, patients um, that we are investigating, still trying to get uh, more data on CD4 counts and um, uh, ARV treatment. The Western Cape have a superb set of data uh, that they've been following cohorts of HIV patients for many years. Um, there is a publication in an NICD um, special COVID bulletin, which you can access online. Um, we have just almost um, 
just over 2,000 patients. And I think we can say there's just a modest increase in mortality, severe disease, probably about twice, two to three times um, from what one would expect. Um, and they're often linked to comorbidities. So this is an area we need to investigate further, but it's not standing out as um, a major uh, cause of, comor of uh, severe outcome or severe disease. Healthcare workers, great concern. So, you know, there's several thousand healthcare workers who've been infected. These are only the ones that have come through um, on the DATCOV system, the Sentinel system, hospitalized. Um, yeah, sadly, 36 of the ones that we've captured have died. Um, I think, again, more senior age, hypertension, diabetes, and obesity have stood out as important comorbidities. But I think the importance of looking at healthcare worker um, data, obviously, is to look at why this is happening, how to reduce the number of infections and deaths, and that's a major focus at the moment. Um, we can discuss that in the last slide, but also to identify healthcare workers who probably should not be at the front line looking after ill patients, um, and we need to uh, manage them, particularly in the hospital setting where we're so short of staff um, that we can't put people out there at risk. I think it poses a, a big issue for uh, particularly general practitioners who are in sole practice, uh, who may be over 65, you know, there are not lots of options for alternative employment in that group. We do have a group um, in persons uh, who, have, who have died without apparent comorbidities. Most of them are in the 40 to 59 year group. Um, we know that comorbidity reporting is not 100% accurate, um, but there are a number of young people with severe disease and in this 40 to 59 year old age group, there are a number, unfortunately, who have died. Um, but uh, I think the important thing is that if COVID doesn't only affect the older people and those with comorbidity giving rise to severe disease, um, you know, there's concerns in otherwise healthy and, and younger persons as well. And that's not exclusive to, to coronaviruses. I think we see that with influenza as well. Next one. Next one, Mandy. Okay, so what about pediatric admissions? I think this has been a lot in the news. Should we be sending, uh, opening up schools and sending children back to school? What role do they play in transmission um, of COVID? Um, what are their risks for most of their disease? We know that for influenza, uh, they play a major role in, in transmission. Um, attend um, to have less severe disease, although we do see severe disease in the under fives with influenza. What about uh, COVID and, um, and their pattern of illness? Well, I think many of you have, uh, um, uh, can appreciate the multi-system inflammatory syndrome that's been reported uh, in relation to COVID. It's very much like Kawasaki's disease, um, some, some similarities in, in treatment. And um, we are, are now capturing those. It's become a notifiable disease. COVID itself is notifiable, but uh, MIS is now also notifiable. Um, and uh, it's important that it is notified so we can get an understanding of uh, the prevalence and where we're seeing it and start to understand uh, a lot more about that. So we've had 889 patients under the age of 18 years. Some of them have been in ICU, some of them have required ventilation, and 14 have died. All of those with severe disease have had comorbidities. I think um, it's been a, a variety. Um, more severe disease has been associated with uh, chronic uh, pulmonary disease, in particular asthma. Also see that in adults, um, chronic pulmonary disease of various kinds, HIV, diabetes, um, and in one or two cases, uh, we've had uh, <clears throat> patients with malignancies. Um, we're still investigating this and trying to get uh, more information on this group. Next slide, please. So what about uh, diagnostics and what about the laboratory? Well, this is kind of uh, what has uh, dictated and prompted uh, a change in uh, testing strategy. 
the laboratories over the last few weeks uh, have been totally overwhelmed. And um, the idea of laboratory confirmation is you have a disease that, um, although we're getting very good at diagnosing it clinically, is nonspecific, and particularly in the, the winter season when you have lots of respiratory viruses, you should get a confirmation because it does um, help you to, to, to manage the patients um, correctly, and also it will prompt a public health response. But it's become very clear that um, our laboratories, both in the private and the public sector, have been overwhelmed, particularly by community testing, which was init initiated to identify hotspots, um, been overwhelmed by the worried well, um, who want to test by contacts of um, patients with COVID, and um, um, a new strategy has had to be put in place to rather focus on those who need a result um, where it really does make a difference to management and um, institution of infection prevention and control. And um, particularly with healthcare workers, um, their, their, their own management um, because of working in a, a vulnerable area. Next one, please. So who should be tested? So the testing priorities are uh, number one, anybody with pneumonia could be somebody in the community, um, but definitely patients with, uh, admitted with COVID pneumonia, ARDS to hospital, because it will guide their management, it will help you with your uh, decisions around antibiotics, and it will <clears throat> direct where they should be managed in, in the hospital. The second group need to be healthcare workers in the broadest sense uh, with respiratory symptoms uh, because they need to be managed and uh, contacts need to be followed up. Um, and then I think this is a bit of a contentious group. Uh, if there's a capacity, I think those with comorbidities with acute respiratory illness um, suggestive of COVID should be tested. I think it's, you know, once you've got a diagnosis in this risk group, uh, it makes you more aware um, of, of what they, um, how things might evolve in this group. And um, the usual is they have this acute respiratory illness and deterioration is, is classically at the end of the first week. So when they get increased shortness of breath um, on day six or day seven, and they already have a diagnosis, um, they need to be told they need to go immediately to the hospital, um, oxygen administration can be life-saving. And at least if they go there and they've got this diagnosis, uh, they can be uh, instantly managed. They don't have to go into a PUI ward. Um, oxygen can be administered uh, very quickly in the right circumstances, and they can follow the, the treatment algorithms. So I feel quite strongly about this group. Um, I know the Western Cape have, have included this in um, the priority list, um, but it obviously depends on capacity. So asymptomatic contacts of, um, of persons who have got confirmed COVID should not be tested. They just need to, to go into quarantine uh, for the appropriate number of days, but do they, they do not require testing. Um, next one. So what, what is the test and what are the specimens? I think most of you are very familiar with this. Very few healthcare workers uh, looking after patients are actually taking the specimens. Uh, most of the testing is done um, if it's outside the hospital in special testing units. I think some of you have uh, experienced that, um, but it's often conducted by the laboratory, um, but, but sometimes you will have to undertake this yourself. So we've moved away from using nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal combinations of swabs because we've run out of swabs and transport media. Um, we've moved towards um, oropharyngeal swabs, one or the other, oropharyngeal or a nasal terminate, sw terminate swab using just a nasal swab. We've looked at uh, saliva. I think the, the data to date have not shown great success. So that is not being used. I think what is important that the specimen um, gets to the laboratory as quickly as possible and it should be uh, transported cold. 
If the patients have low respiratory infections, a variety of specimens can be used, sputum, tracheal aspirates, bronchoalveolar, uh, lavage, um, just taking care that uh, you know, infection control um, processes are, are put into place. Important to fill out the forms accurately and, uh, and to submit the data. The data is very, very important to us, both in terms of following up contacts, but also getting an idea of what is the situation in the country uh, regarding um, the distribution of the cases um, and you know, to provide the data that we've uh, shared with you. Next one, please. So uh, yes, uh, we don't have perfect tests. We're using molecular tests, PCR. It is the diag diagnostic method of choice. It is very specific for SARS-CoV-2. I think issues around cross-contamination in the laboratory is not a common um, finding. I think the problem lies around the sensitivity of, of the test. And at best, it's probably 70 to 80% sensitive. It's very rarely, um, I don't think it's approaching 100% in, in any center. It depends very much on the quality of the specimen you've taken and the um, speed with which it's processed. When we had lots of backlogs, um, you know, uh, it, it, it detects uh, RNA, which um, you know, you don't, it's, not, it's not dependent on having a viable um, virus or uh, material present, um, but certainly the sensitivity will go down um, after some days. And I think anyway, doing a, a PCR test in the specimen the, after 15 days, um, sensitivity will be lower and it really has no public health benefit uh, in following up contacts and uh, quarantining them. So what are the results? Well, there seem to be such a variety in, of ways that laboratories report and that's caused quite a lot of confusion. Positive is a positive, a negative, um, might need to be repeated if the initial one is negative and you think COVID-19 um, is likely. Um, remember that the um, highest uh, concentration of virus is early in the illness, usually um, right at the beginning, positive day before, um, day of onset, and that it will gradually reduce, although in very ill patients, that uh, it may continue to be viable for much longer. Um, so when you take the, the swab in the course of the illness will also affect the results. I think some of the reports uh, that have confused people, um, inconclusive means the control didn't work and we cannot give a result and uh, you need to repeat the specimen. Um, indeterminate um, is likely to be positive. It's often um, um, a high CT value. Um, sometimes it's one gene, although we're regarding that as positive, we shouldn't be, re be reporting indeterminate anymore. It's positive or it's not positive. Um, inconclusive, I think is very clear. We can't give you a result. Um, I think what's also uh, important, and I'm gonna show you a case uh, um, where COVID uh, um, was misdiagnosed to the detriment of the patient, is that not everything is COVID. Um, and uh, other diseases are, are, are being missed. We're currently in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the influenza season, usually starts at the end of May, goes on towards the end of September, but there are very, very few cases of influenza. Certainly our surveillance systems aren't operating uh, optimally, Patients are not going to the doctors with a respiratory infection. They're either managing it as COVID um, or they're just keeping away. So we don't have a good handle on influenza, but overall it seems to have gone down. And this is something that other Southern Hemisphere countries are seeing. It's possibly related to some of the non-pharmaceutical inventions, which interventions which also apply to um, protection from influenza. So the hand washing, the distancing, the using of masks, um, school closure, I think had an effect, um, but almost no influenza around and all very little RSV. But um, we mustn't miss TB and patients with TB obviously can have COVID on top of that. 
and uh, we mustn't miss other diseases. And I'm going to show you an important example. Um, patient uh, presented, um, it was about, uh, it was May, and um, I think the area was uh, focused on COVID and they weren't thinking about other things. Next one, please. So this is an 18-year-old uh, resident in northern uh, KwaZulu-Natal, presented to the clinic with fever and body pains, was treated symptomatically, um, a COVID uh, test was uh, done and sent off, and the patient was, was sent home. It's an area where uh, access to COVID testing is, is quite limited, and uh, delays of at least 10 days plus uh, have been reported. The next day, the patient returned uh, to the clinic. Um, she'd already been sick for about four days before she went in the first place. Um, patients are very afraid to go to clinics, so they are delaying presenting. So when she did present uh, for the second time, on the second day, uh, she had quite severe respiratory dis distress. She was referred to the district hospital um, with the diagnosis of query COVID. She was admitted to the COVID PUI ward. The next ray wasn't done. Uh, she did have some basic bloods done, showing a, quite a profound uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, a moderate leukopenia, and um, she died. Based on the um, finding of the thrombocytopenia, the, uh, the hospital, and uh, correctly so, they had a lot of experience, did a malaria test on her, and it was positive. Um, and she was a case of uh, malaria, um, severe malaria that had been missed by the clinic, late presentation on the part of the patient. Um, I think the awareness of malaria has been uh, pushed aside because of COVID, it was quite late in the season. It's an area that um, has perhaps less malaria these days because of good control. So, you know, I think we've really got a, a lot of work to do, uh, improving uh, patient's knowledge, awareness, of what are really incredibly important diseases other than COVID. Next one. Next one, okay. So um, here are three x-rays of um, ARDS. And without a history, you would be hard pushed to differentiate them. The one on the top left um, is in fact uh, a malaria ARDS. And respiratory distress in malaria can be um, one of two and possibly three uh, problems. The one would be early on would be a metabolic acidosis, which can increase your respiratory rate. And it was possibly the problem in, in this young girl. We don't know. She never had a chest X-ray. Uh, she was in the COVID ward and uh, I think access to, to X-rays was quite limited. Um, and then the second and important one is an ARDS, a malaria-related ARDS, which usually occurs about day three, day four of illness, and is very much um, part of uh, severe malaria and often has a, a, a poor outcome. But I think looking at that in uh, this young girl, if they hadn't thought about malaria, I think COVID would have been diagnosed. I think they, um, they're a very astute uh, physician, saw the low platelet count, which is a very common finding in malaria, um, the uh, rapid test confirmed malaria, um, but by then it was too late. So I think if it's a malaria area and the patient presents with fever, um, cough, respiratory distress, just think about malaria. It is so easy to do a rapid test. We are moving into the malaria season in five weeks time. Control has not been very good in the last season. I don't expect it to be good because the teams are really experiencing lots of problems in rolling out prevention and spraying. We are going to see an increase. And please, don't, uh, please don't miss these important diseases. The x-ray on the right is the typical uh, COVID pneumonia moving on to an ARDS, and I think many of you are very familiar with that. And the picture at the bottom is uh, influenza um, pneumonia, and, and really not easy to see all the differences, some subtle ones, I think COVID's more peripheral, but um, you know, when the lungs are all white, can't really tell the difference. So laboratories don't always help you. Res results are delayed. Um, very little influenza, much more likely to be COVID. Um, 
but don't forget some of the other common diseases. I think TB is another program that we are um, not getting adequate um, specimen submissions and um, I'm not quite sure where the TV stats are, are, are going to go in the near future. Next one, please. Okay, so what about other tests? Well, serology is not the answer. Serol serological tests can measure a variety of antibodies, IgG, IgM, IgA, and um, there's been lots of, uh, lots of noise around these. There are two types. There's a rapid test, which is the point of care test. That's the dipstick. The only one that has been accepted as having an adequate sensitivity and specificity um, is the Orient gene. The um, SAPRA and the NHLS and other players have done extensive evaluation of a huge number of these rapid tests. This is the only one that uh, passed, the, passed the process. Um, it is currently being used only within the uh, NHLS in the public health system, but it is only appropriate for seroepidemiological studies. There are lab-based um, serological tests. Um, these are high throughput, mainly ELISA. Again, sensitivity, specificity has been evaluated. The big problem with these tests, both the rapid test point of care and the lab-based ones, is that they are invariably negative in the first week of illness. You don't start to see uh, positive results, antibodies present, until at least 10 days after the onset of illness. So they play absolutely no role uh, in patients with acute symptoms of, of COVID uh, illness, um, which will guide you in terms of management and public health response. And they should not be used in place of PCR, even if PCR access is difficult to diagnose COVID in acutely ill patients. You cannot use them to confirm immunity. And immunity passports based on a, a serological test have absolutely no meaning. I know many industries, mining industries, travel-related industries have wanted to go that way, but really we don't have good uh, information to confirm that they're useful. So the only use of serological tests is to look back at your outbreak and see attack rates, see how many people in the population have been affected. We also know, unfortunately, that the antibody teeters do, do wane uh, after uh, not a very long time. So I think going forward, I think we have to uh, examine further where these may be um, available. So it's very tempting to use the rapid tests, quick, easy, cheap, and nasty in a practice to uh, Consider the diagnosis of, of COVID in a patient with acute respiratory infection. A negative means nothing. Please do not use these tests. Many of them are out there. A lot of unscrupulous um, traders in serological tests who claim they're SAPRA accredited and um, they're not. Next one. So this is the, the current um, confusion of the moment. Um, the guidelines have been changed. Um, not sure they were shared in the best possible way. So um, uh, I've got the, the information that's hottest off the press. Um, so let me go through isolation and quarantine. So isolation applies to persons with illness who are isolated until they have little to no risk of causing an onward infection. So de-isolation um, has been changed. For mild cases, it is now 10 days after symptom onset. Um, and at about eight days, um, using um, uh, based on a number of culture studies that were done, it's been shown that very little to no culturable virus will be present in patients who've had mild illness. So they, they essentially are not infectious. They may be RNA, so they may still have a positive PCR, but it does not indicate um, that they have to remain in isolation. 
It does not indicate that they are infectious um, and it should not be done. We, we, we simply use a time-based um, criteria for de-isolating de patients. So mild disease, 10 days after symptom onset um, is adequate. If it was somebody who had asymptomatic and they were just detected by chance, it is also 10 days after their positive test. For a mild case, it's not 10 days after the positive test, it's 10 days after the onset of symptoms. For severe disease, they may have higher numbers of, of um, viruses, they may excrete them for a longer time. So it's 10 days after clinical stability. And what we mean by that is when they no longer require supplemental oxygen. Again, they don't require a repeat PCR. Many patients are in fact PCR positive for a longer time. Uh, some are, are, are days to weeks. Um, I think there've been some records uh, reported, but it does not mean they are infectious. They just confuse everybody and they should not be done. It's not good use of uh, limited PCR test kits. What's important to do is um, even if you, if there are a 10 days, is to assess medical fitness for return to work. Many people who've been infected um, are tired. Um, symptoms may last for, for a much longer time, but I think assessing medical fitness for return to work together with the 10 days is, is really important. It's not just simply a time-based time system. Next one. So what about Quarant, um, what about healthcare workers? So in fact, a very similar thing applies. It's 10 days. So these are infected healthcare workers, um, again, mild, severe, the same criteria, the same number of days, no need for repeat testing, but very importantly, assess medical fitness for return to work. Wards are busy, I don't have to tell you that. People are working incredibly long hours. Um, and I think we, you know, we need to be kind to our colleagues. We need to assess their ability to work. I know some people push themselves, um, but I think it's both the time and the fitness that must be considered. Next one. <clears throat> so what about quarantine? So quarantine is somebody who's exposed. Um, these are the... Um, this is the proposed quarantine um, and removal of quarantine for healthcare workers. What is a high risk exposure? Somebody who's been um, uh, uh, in contact with a positive case or a likely positive case at less than one meter for more than 15 minutes and hasn't worn a PPE or adequate PPE, which means a surgical mask for the most part um, and some eye covering. So that is a high risk exposure. Currently it's um, isol as quarantine for, for seven days. Um, we are very short of healthcare workers in the health setting. Um, and this is a voluntary uh, kind of way to go. We're not forcing people, but the recommendation up to now has been to do PCR at seven days. If it's negative, D, um, We'll remove them from quarantine. I think the word de-isolate is a bit confusing. Return to work with full PPE, monitor for symptoms, avoid immunocompromised patients, and, and hope for the best. The pr new proposal, and it's not been passed yet, but it's uh, kind of in, um, in the process, is to reduce that um, to five days to test, probably a day or two before the tests come back, and if it's negative, they're asymptomatic, back to work uh, with the same criteria. So it's still currently seven days. I think in the next day or two, it may be reduced to five days. And this is voluntary return to work. I don't think anybody can force somebody um, to, to undergo this, this kind of reduced uh, um, yeah, process. Next one. So what about the general public? Well, in fact, that hasn't changed. So these are people who've been 
uh, exposed to positive uh, family members, um, they've had a high risk exposure, same criteria, less than one meter, um, more than 15 minutes. I don't think a cloth mask, yes or no, makes a difference um, because it doesn't protect you from infection. Cloth masks protect people who are infected from sharing their drop, infected droplets. Quarantine has remained at four days and then they can be removed from quarantine. And the reason for that is the incubation period uh, can be up to 14 days. I think we've seen a number of people who presented with symptoms on 12 days, although the usual is probably from about three to, 17, three to seven days. So it remains at 14 days and this is unlikely to change. No repeat testing is required. They simply stop their quarantine. So I think it's getting your head around quarantine versus isolation, the difference between the general public, the difference between um, having virus that is now uh, reducing and an incubation period that remains uh, what it is. Next one. Okay, so what's the good news? Well, it's around the vaccine. You know, COVID's going to be around with us for a long time. We're going to have second waves. We're going to have clusters. We're going to have outbreaks. We really don't know what the future holds. And um, I don't think we can live through endless lockdowns and uh, the way of life that um, we've, we've had to adopt now. So I think the answer has to be a vaccine. Um, and there's been a major, major rush uh, to produce vaccines, to get them out, to test them. Currently, there are more than 100 vaccines in some stage of development, and probably between six and eight, six to eight vaccines that are already out um, in, uh, in, in various stages of, of um, clinical trials. So I think the front runners are, are two vaccines. The first one is the one developed by the Jenner Institute uh, at Oxford. Um, this is a multinational study. The, um, uh, the Jenner Institute's in partnership with AstraZeneca, who have undertaken to produce uh, several billion doses. Um, three stages to the vaccine studies. Um, we're now actually starting stage, uh, the, the third one here. So what is this vaccine? So it's a vectored vaccine using a common cold virus, an adenovirus of um, chimpanzee origin. Um, it's safe, it doesn't multiply, it's been, uh, um, it's been changed so uh, it's not going to cause uh, any problems in, in people. Um, and it's been coded uh, with a spike protein um, against, the two, against the spike protein of COVID-19. So the spike protein is that um, spike that you've seen on pictures of the COVID virus. It allows attachment of the virus uh, to various cells and it therefore can um, facilitate the entry of the virus into the cells. So if you, um, a vaccine, if, you, if you have this vaccine, you inject it and the body will mount an immune response against the spike protein. So when the virus is in, the, um, the COVID virus uh, is introduced, somebody gets infected, um, those antibodies will um, act against uh, the spike protein and will stop the virus from attaching. So um, we're looking at an efficacy of not 100%. Uh, I think they're aiming for about 60%. The um, first study was looking at safety, and I think the safety data has been extremely, extremely um, positive. I think some minor um, par um, uh, adverse reactions, pain at the site, fever, you give panado, it in fact reduces that, but no major adverse effects. The second part was to do immune studies, and this um, um, study, um, the, this article from the, uh, the Lancet was released yesterday and with great results, showing that in the first 200 patients uh, vaccinated, the immune response has been excellent. I think they've looked at one dose and a second dose um, um, in, in some of the patients and in those given a second dose, I think 100% of those had an adequate immune response. And that is both a T cell response and a, a humoral cell response. 
Um, the third component of, of um, the vaccine evaluation is to look at efficacy, and uh, that's really where we come in. So the study, South Africa is one of the study sites, they're recruiting 2,000 participants, volunteers, in um, Johannesburg and in Cape Town, and they're still looking for volunteers. So please, um, please volunteer anybody between the age of 18 and 65 who doesn't have comorbidities um, can volunteer. It is placebo controlled, so you may get saline, uh, uh, <clears throat> and you will have to, you know, attend clinic quite uh, quite frequently to have nasal swabs to have your immune response tested, um, but it's really a great cause. So um, study started, the first uh, volunteers were recruited towards the end of June. Um, the trial is moving into Cape Town, and if you contact me, I'll put you in contact with the, the organizers and how you can be part of this. And if you didn't recognize him, that's Martin Vela, um, having uh, being one of the volunteers. I have to say he's looking rather pale and frightened behind his mask but at least uh, he stepped up and a number of my colleagues have done the same. The study will be done in Brazil and the United States and further studies will be done in the United Kingdom. And uh, I think it's looking very promising uh, for the moment, but I don't think we can expect a, a vaccine to be available commercially out there until next year. I think the efficacy studies are incredibly important and um, I think it's very important that um, we're part of this so that we hopefully can get access to the vaccine. And also we can show that the vaccine is working because we have a lot of circulating virus. Um, you don't want to do the study where you know, the outbreak is gone. Uh, you want to test it where there is a pandemic ongoing to test that it really, really works. That is the true test. So watch the space and uh, hopefully more good news. The other vaccine is a messenger RNA study, um, a vaccine that is um, based, um, uh, it's an NIH study in the United States with uh, Moderna. Um, I don't think they're quite as advanced. And I think mRNA vaccines uh, for other viruses haven't been quite as successful. So I think the vectored vaccines really are, um, in my mind, the, the best hope. But we'll wait and see. And hopefully this is going to happen. Next one, and I think it's the last slide. So um, healthcare worker safety. I know Caroline Maslow gave you a, a wonderful talk um, on infection control in the hospital setting. It's absolutely key uh, to preventing infection, particularly in healthcare workers, to reducing the number of hospital related outbreaks. Um, lots of questions um, around um, airborne, aerosols, um, droplet spread. I think for the majority of patients, um, it's around droplet spread, protection of healthcare workers using surgical masks, risks of aerosolization, I think with well-identified procedures, uh, suctioning, um, the uh, uh, access to taking specimens, um, I think of concern where an N95 mask um, does need to be worn. I think high flow oxygen was another area where there was concern about transmission. Um, I think the biggest problem is around proper use of masks um, and then infection outside of this kind of health setting. So in hospitals, I think healthcare workers um, may well be infected in communities, transport to hospitals, tea rooms and hopefully all tea rooms and meeting rooms have been closed. I think outside of the wards, um, masks are worn in all manner of way, dangling from the ears, below the, the nose, hanging around the necks, people touching the outside of their masks with their hands. Um, I think attention to, to compliance and the proper wearing of masks will certainly go a long way to reducing healthcare workers in infection. So I think I'm going to end there. I think there are a couple of questions which we can take. And um, be safe. The front line's a tough one. Um, mental, mental, social, psychosocial issues um, we need to deal with. We need to be kind to ourselves. 
we will get through this and thank you for being there i think you're all doing an extraordinary job thank you thanks mandy Perfect. Thanks so much, Prof. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the questions on your side, or would you like me to read them out to you? Um, I think I can see them. Um, so I'll start from the bottom. Um, let me move up. Um, maybe you can just go to the top. I think I'm... Um, so how soon can we expect the vaccine? Well, I think we have to wait for the phase three studies to see uh, what the efficacy is and if we can reach the 60%, I don't think before next year. Um, I think the, you know, AstraZeneca looking very closely at um, scaling up and how, you know, we're gonna need billions of this. We need to ensure equitable access. Very important that South Africa is part of this um, to ensure that we do have access. Uh, it's been a problem with a, a number of previous vaccines. Um, but I don't think before next year. Um, so what is the increased risk in well-controlled diabetics and hypertensives? I think that's an area we need to explore more. Um, I think uh, well-controlled diabetics, well-controlled hypertensives, probably slightly less risk. Um, early treatment with oxygen, as soon as they show in, in increased um, signs of increased uh, respiratory rate. Um, hypoxia is not always easy to detect. We have those happy hypoxics. Um, can, must must be instituted. I think um, some of the uh, delays in accessing hospital care, you know, the many challenges in many communities have really contributed to increased mortality rates. I think uh, oxygen supplies are an issue. Currently, I think it's they're okay, but um, it's an area that needs to be scaled up. I think many of these um, overflow hospitals, these field hospitals, I think oxygen supply is, is a challenge. I think the Eastern Cape is particularly a concern. So yeah, this is something that I can't emphasize enough. Early treatment, rapid access to oxygen, life-saving. Um, BCG, I think, yeah, I yeah. think there's a couple of the others. BCG, well, you know, when, when, when the pandemic was really in the Northern Hemisphere, they, would say, they were saying, well, perhaps Africa is protected, a younger population group, lots of previous TB, BCG was very much part of the schedule, and uh, perhaps it will protect because it has some effects on immune responses. I don't think uh, we know everything about that. I know they, have, they are doing a study in, uh, I think in the Western Cape, looking at BCG, uh, Greg Hussey wrote a, um, a very good uh, opinion piece on that, and you can access that on our website. I don't think we know the answer to that, but possibly, uh, yeah, a, a question mark there, and not, not, not for definite. Um, so, does the shortened isolation quarantine period not a compromise? Look, a lot of consideration and thought is wringing of hands and back and forth. In terms of the shortened um, isolation for the general public, no. Um, the, the 14 days was always uh, very conservative. And um, I think it's been well shown in a number of studies that there's almost no virus that's culturable, therefore uh, a problem for others after eight days. The quarantine is very different. That is 14 days for the general public that is unlikely to be changed and it speaks to the incubation period. The shortened isolation for healthcare workers is, um, I guess it is a compromise, but as many of you will know, um, we're running out of healthcare workers in hospitals. So it is voluntary, no one's gonna force you. Um, in, in a number of countries, in fact, exposed healthcare workers are just continuing to work with full PPE um, and they're monitored. So, you know, I think, um, yeah, it is a compromise, but we need to, we need to make sure that uh, we protect you, but we also continue to operate an essential service. So that's a, you know, that's a difficult field. Um, 
COVID is an epithelial disease, receptors protecting the inner side of alveoli. How will antibodies protect? So I think it's um, antibodies against, um, as the virus enters, uh, you'll have that spike protein and hopefully the antibodies will, will meet the spike protein and, and sort it out. But it's about humoral immunity and, um, and cellular immunity. And that's, that's a field obviously to explore more. In the patients that are uh, moving too fast, um, oh, any role of PCR testing of stools? Absolutely not. We don't think uh, feces has a role in transmission. So, um, so no. no, no role in doing that. No, no um, value in doing that. In the patients with no comorbidities that died, were there risk factors? So that's a different, that's a difficult one. We don't have risk um, comorbidities reported on every single patient. We know that um, some patients have undiagnosed or um, uh, glucose uh, problems. So there may be some of those. Uh, I think obesity is under is underreported. Certainly in our first few weeks of reporting, we hadn't included it. So, but there, there definitely are some with, with no obvious comorbidities. So everybody out there thinks, well, you know, protect the, the, the older people and those with comorbidities and younger people who otherwise well seem to be having gatherings and, uh, you know, forgetting that there's a, we're in the surge phase of this pandemic and it's a kind of free for all. Um, so definitely there is some risk, it's much lower, but it, it's not a no risk. Um, and that's an area we need to look at. Perhaps there are subtle things that, that need more exploring. Um, what else? Um, how infectious are school children with coronavirus? Yeah, so I think they, they do play some role. I mean, they, they may get infected, they may be um, asymptomatic, they may transmit the virus to grandparents at home or to parents with comorbidities, so they're not a no risk. Um, they themselves have, as I mentioned, very limited uh, severe illness. Um, but you've got to look at the positive and the negative is about sending children back to school. We live in a country where for many children, it's their only access to a meal. Um, mothers, single mothers, sing, uh, parents have to go to work. They have nowhere to leave the children. Um, I think this is quite a, a difficult and controversial and a topical issue at the moment. But in our setting, access to learning, not everybody has online access. I think the, the positives outweigh the negatives, and we just need to manage that. Um, I think there are lots of fears um, around so social, psychological issues, fears on the part of the teachers. I think teachers with uh, comorbidities, older teachers, I think we do need to protect them. Um, any, I think the anticoagulation thing, I think you'll have to ask. Uh, I think, and okay, so anticoagulation is, um, is very much part of treatment together with dexamethasone and with oxygen. And um, I think the, those three are, 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 are really the cornerstone of, of managing patients. Um, can you get corona from drinking contaminated water? No, I don't think you can. And the role of fomite, so surfaces in transmission, I think has been overplayed. I think it's about distancing, it's about washing your hands, and it's about masking when you're in uh, a general public uh, arena. Um, have I covered everything? Reinfection, don't know much about that. We've certainly had a number of patients who, not a number, we've had actually very few who've recovered, been PCR negative, um, become symptomatic again or PCR positive again, but there would be very few. So it's likely that there is an immune response. We don't know how long it lasts, certainly the antibodies wane. Um, that's an area that we, we need to explore further. And I think I've covered most of them. Yeah. Anything else? You can put up your hands. Thanks, Prof. I think we might, well, we'll maybe give a round for one more, uh, one more, two more questions. We have gone quite late over time. We've gone over time. <laughs> so I don't, I don't want to keep everybody too late. No, uh, I think that's it. I think we've covered all of them. And if anybody else has questions, they can email them and you can look on our website. There's lots of uh, guidelines and 
and good information. But I'm happy to ask, answer them after the, after the uh, uh, webinar. So thank you very much. I think that's it. Perfect. Thanks so much, Prof. Um, uh, thank you for a brilliant talk. It's, it's still, there's still so much to learn that we haven't heard before, and it, your insight is very, very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mandy, um, I'm not sure if you want to close off. I don't, I'm not sure, I can't remember what the session is for tomorrow night. Maybe you could remind us. Um, Chris, uh, just again, Lucille, thank you so much for always agreeing to talk um, and always giving us such good learning. And we haven't forgotten about malaria and perhaps we should pick it up uh, <laughs> next week or so in our malaria series. Um, so tomorrow night is Professor Feroza Matara uh, from Wits University and Charlotte McClicke. And she's going to talk on end of life decisions. Um, uh, we hit a, a record number of people tonight. Uh, Chris, you said 250, eh? Uh, 260. We actually crossed 260 tonight. 260, Prof Bloomberg, you're at the top of the of the um, uh, the scale at the moment. We'll see what Prof Matara can get tomorrow evening. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, everybody. And uh, apologies, the CPD certificates will be coming yeah. out round two. I made a mistake. I sent 2019 uh, CPD dates out, so I will redo them and send them to everyone. Perhaps what we'll do is wait till the end of the series, and then we can send it as one CPD certificate. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow night. And be safe. Always. <laughs>